and so opens Steve Reich's piano phase and continues on for about 19 more minutes along the same vein. Uh, the topic of today's class will be two aspects of this phase shifting piece by Steve Reich. Where we're going to look at first the implicit or implied melodies inside the basic pattern that repeats over and over, at least the first of the basic patterns, it changes as the piece goes on. Um, and second, we're going to look at the uh, pattern of interactions between the two pianos, uh, both in terms of small scale interactions, um, what happens when things are in transition, what happens when they lock into phase, uh, and how that shapes the overall piece. So first, a little background. Uh, Steve Reich began writing phase shifting music originally for uh, recorded tapes. The idea was he would place, um, he would have uh, the same recording of a phase shifting of a loop of some kind, and he would play it back simultaneously on two um, reel-to-reel -reel tape decks where he could uh, manually influence the speed of one of them to create these phase shifting effects. He actually didn't think human beings could do it, and then he changed his mind, and it turns out all kinds of human beings can do it. Uh, and so he made a uh, number of pieces for piano, in this case, piano marimbas. I've heard it both ways. Um, clapping music is another example of phase shifting. There's violin phase. I've heard violin phase played on the cello. And um, uh, there's a number of other ones, and all of you might be familiar with them. I don't believe there's a tuba phase. I could be wrong. Anyway, this was very early in his career, um, mostly in the late 60s and uh, into the early 70s, possibly. Uh, Steve Reich, um, I saw him at a conference, at a, uh, actually a workshop, a, th a rhythmic theory workshop about 10, 15 years ago. And at that time, he was writing music that didn't bear any resemblance to this. It was more, uh, more expansive in its vocabulary of all kinds. But um, everybody knows the phase shifting music of Steve Reich, mainly because theorists seem to like it a lot. <clears throat> Excuse me, didn't bring my Snapple today. Um, in any case, the idea is that there's this, as you can see from the score, there is uh, a simple pattern, a particular loop that is played over and over. Thus, the multiple repeats. There's the simple pattern at the beginning, uh, four to eight times by the first piano or marimba, and then uh, the second piano or marimba, or other instrument if you like, uh, perhaps unauthorized by the composer. Another one comes in and plays in unison the identical pattern. And as you can see, the repeats are somewhat ad lib. He says 12 to 18 times in the score. And that represents the second phase or stage of the, comp of the performance. Um, after that, the, uh, there's a, a series of maneuvers. Think of it as something like uh, the equivalent of subject entries versus episodes and fugues uh, and some aesthetic similarity to that. There are stable sections and there are transition sections. And the transition sections, as you can see, the second piano is meant to accelerate uh, very, very, very slightly, very, very slightly over a period of, I guess, depending on how good they are at micro timing, uh, of four to 16 repeats of the overall pattern until the second piano is shifted over by exactly one sixteenth note. And you can see that in uh, the realignment of the first notes at uh, phase three. Okay, and that's, and then the, the pattern is basically uh, rotated, if you think, want to think of it that way, in the second piano and in the original alignment in the first piano. Um, and this procedure goes on uh, until we've achieved um, the full cycle of rotations of the 12 note figure. And uh, just to scan ahead a bit, we won't focus on the entire piece, right? Um, as you can see, when you get to the uh, 12th phase, we're getting pretty close. And in the 13th phase, we're almost there. And in the 14th phase, uh, they're lined up again, right? And then uh, everything, uh, the second piano fades out and we start the first piano plays that and then shifts to a shorter program, a shorter pattern in phase 16. You can see the shorter pattern has only eight notes. And then that process repeats again for a number of times. Uh, again, we phase out uh, eventually the first piano and the second piano comes in and breaks down its pattern little by little until we're left with this 
four note pattern. And then the four note pattern goes through these uh, four different phase shifts until we get back to the very end and it's lined up. So we go from the 12 note pattern all through its permutations of phase shifting, the eight note pattern all through its permutations of phase shifting, and then finally the four note pattern all through its permutations of phase shifting. And the whole thing takes uh, around 20 minutes in most, uh, most performances. So uh, back to the beginning. So you can see the, the general process for it. Um, and it, there's a couple of questions, a couple of kind of uh, analytical approaches we can take as we look at this. One of them is simply to analyze the basic pattern itself. And we're going to start there. But first, I'll tell you what the other thing is. Uh, the other thing is to see uh, what happens to, uh, to the combinations of notes, uh, combinations of patterns in each of the different phase shifted areas. And what happens in terms of some kind of rhythmic dissonance in the uh, accelerando patterns where things are getting out of phase and back in, in before they get locked into phase again. Um, and that's where we get in some interesting questions um, that certain models that we have up to this point don't seem to hold up in terms of describing the dissonance. And, um, and we'll see what we might come up with that. Anyway, back to the initial pattern. Let's go ahead and listen to that again. Uh, just the opening pattern, and I want to point out a few things about it. So uh, it's kind of interesting the way he sets it up. So he's got right hand and left hand alternating attacks. Uh, the left hand is stems, um, uh, the beams at the bottom stems going down from the notes and the right hand stems going up. Uh, and you see the right hand has a pattern uh, which essentially repeats every two notes in the right hand, F sharp, C sharp, F sharp, C sharp. Right, and the left hand uh, pattern is uh, a three cycle of three different things, right? Okay, and when they interchange, you get something um, uh, that's the more complex combination of the two of them. Uh, when I hear this, and I think most people when they hear it, you, one doesn't hear the right hand as a real entity, right? I'm sure performing it will feel that very much. Um, but you hear a fluid uh, grouping of all 12 notes. I, you don't really hear that much of right hand and left hand being separated. There's no registral separation to really help you hear that in any way. Um, uh, but what you do hear, what most people hear, is some kind, of, um, some kind of derived melodies that fall out of this in different places. Sometimes the registral separation, not of right and left hand, but of higher and lower notes. In other words, the E and F sharp down in one spot and the B, C sharp and D up in the other. Right, you tend to hear those things coming out separately and sometimes you hear melodies that derive from those registers. Uh, have, and, and I hear different ones. Sometimes you hear different orientations of what's strong and what's weak rhythmically. Sometimes you hear different groupings of notes. Sometimes you hear different um, metrical layers. Three, if we think of the 16th note as being our, uh, our one unit in Krebsian sense of, right, of metrical layers, then we might hear um, three layers or four layers. We might hear them shifted, six layers that are shifted, even shifted 12 layers, depending on how you put it all together. What I encourage you to do this time listening to it is to try to come up with uh, your own ideas about how you hear it uh, how you hear independent melodies that are derived from this figure coming out and what kind of metrical layers they seem to represent. Uh, so here's the opening again. Okay, so um, I've got my own. I can't really hear what your ideas are right now. Uh, I just want to make sure you form your own 
um, before I start imposing some of mine, or if not imposing, at least uh, coloring your hearing of this with my own suggestion, because when we do this in the live class, there's at least three or four or five different versions that come up from the various students. So I hear something that goes, right? In other words, I hear some pattern, and I'll just go ahead and highlight this in blue, that starts here. Right? Right? And I hear another accent on that F sharp. So basically what I'm hearing is a four layer at that point. And then I hear another accent on this F sharp later, but I hear the strongest one for some reason in the middle of the measure with that kind of snap-like figure, right? Sort of scotch snap almost type figure uh, at the opening of it. So that would be a four layer. Uh, four layer, but the 12 layer of that would actually start there. So that's one, one thing that I hear coming out of the melody. Again, I'll play it uh, from the beginning and you see if you can, um, uh, if you can get that, if you can hear that as well. Okay, so I poisoned you enough to hear that one if you didn't before, perhaps. Uh, but I hear other things going on as well, and I can even hear that shifted in different ways. So, this is a different four layer that I hear, right on, and I'll go ahead and uh, put it here. So here. Dun, da, dun. Da, da, da. And then I hear a strong, almost a very strong sub two going on here. Dun, da, 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 da. Dun. And then a very a weak, but nonetheless present four would be at the beginning. Dun, da, 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 da. And so I hear the 12 again with a high D. Again, this is just something that I hear, maybe it's unimaginative, but it's the way that I often hear this thing breaking down. So you could hear, uh, in that case, we've got all kinds of displacement going on. We've got uh, D4 plus one, and we've got D12 plus one. Um, and yet those aren't really dissonances. Those are things that I don't necessarily hear happening simultaneously. Those are, those represent not so much a dissonance, right? But just a kind of a different, uh, a different phase relationship. That is, if I hear one or the other, just like the rabbit duck phenomenon we've talked about before, I can flip back between one and the other. Uh, so listen to that top one and listen to what I'm saying so far again from the beginning. And there's a lot of other possibilities built in there. You might even hear uh, three layers in this one, right? Right, so something like... Um, oh, I can't even do that. One, two, three, three, right? So... Uh, that right, okay. Uh, one, and then one. So, in other words, let's change the color on this one. Uh, we could hear a three 
Threes like that. I'm not sure what would be the first part of that, but we could have those threes. And then this might be represented as a grouping, right? For three. Again, it's not really a dissonance, it's an alternative. It's like turning, turning the gem around, uh, seeing it catch the light in a different way, right? You're not seeing and perceiving both things at the same time. It's more of a, of a, of a choice, of a shifting, of a journey you can take by going from one to the other. You can turn the beat around for yourself as you're listening to it. Okay, one more time through the beginning, listening to these possibilities. So you can see within this simple figure, you have the possibility of hearing a lot of different kinds of inherent melodies. And I think the beauty of it is not deciding that, you know, one way is the right hearing or one way is more appropriate based on the number of, of syntactical accents that you can subscribe, that you can ascribe to one level versus another, therefore making it the dominant and the right one. No, it's a, it's a beautiful thing you can turn around and listen to in different ways. So uh, that's great. And that goes on, right? But what happens when things start to change? Well, let's leave aside for a moment the issue of what happens uh, during the process of change. And let's go immediately to hear what happens um, as we get into some of these other phased sections. So moving on. When we've locked into this new pattern now at three, you can see or you can hear <clears throat> um, just a little bit of what, uh, what has happened, right? Now that we get a couple of things, we start to hear, right? You've got, you got this, this mixture of these ideas and sometimes what you hear is uh, the certain kinds of, of uh, clusters that come along. Listen again to where to this pattern, see what you hear dropping out now that I've found the right spot in the recording. Okay. Okay, we're, we're locked into that one, still about to break out. Is what I hear is one of the things coming out of okay. That is, um, you get the, the interaction of these two parts kind of brings you the high notes, depending on what they're sounding together with. Right? The cluster is right at the beginning is very interesting. Also, you hear this kind of seconds, uh, you know, interval classes, twos and, uh, and uh, two and five, dominating this between the parts, one, two, and five. Um, so different kinds of possibilities for how that works. So in other words, something like this from the beginning, right? right? You kind of hear some of these things going down around like, this accent there, that one down there, this is where the high notes pull out of things. So we can hear a three group starting right lined up with the beginning this way. Something about that marked every time by that uh, crunchy right at the beginning of it um, uh, makes me hear it that way. Of course, I have to ignore other things along the way. It's just one way to do it. And as the piece goes on, let's go on a little bit further and see what happens uh, after this. As it goes on, you're going to start hearing different uh, different kinds of patterns 
coming more to the fore just in terms of rhythm, let alone the kaleidoscopic quality of the intervals as they spill and tumble together into new combinations. Now here, those, those perfect fourths and fifths, the way they get locked together, right? Let's just see how many places we have in interval class five, if you remember. There's a E to B, F sharp, and, we, and then these here, right? Um, how many more than boom, 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 boom. Boom, right. All those perfect fourths and fifths. Weird, right? Makes me hear um, this marks that and that that I hear very even, almost square sounding. Right, these very clear sixes and twelves right on the downbeat. Now you can hear other things against that. In fact, all through this piece, anything you've heard once, you can choose to bring it out as part of the experience. Um, but um, this one tends to really emphasize the squareness of the twelves and the sixes lining up exactly with the bar lines. So as the piece goes on, I encourage you to listen to the entire piece and hear the different kinds of patterns that emerge intervallically and rhythmically or, or metrically. What do you hear as implied layers that are brought to the fore by the different combinations? Um, but the other thing I wanted, to, uh, wanted us to talk about was the, um, uh, what happens in between when we're getting from one phase to the next and we're going through the phase shifting. And as you'll see what happens, um, you know, in terms of the description, the performance description right there um, is accelerated very slightly while the top one holds steady. Piano one holds uh, steady and piano two, um, sorry. Uh, yeah, piano one holds steady and piano two moves uh, ever so slightly faster. So, you know, you think about that in terms of metrical dissonance, it's not really stable. It's not a stable grouping dissonance or displacement dissonance. Uh, you want to think displacement because out of phase seems to imply displacement. But what gets out of phase each time around is actually the pattern of pitches because it's all even 16th notes. Uh, once they lock into a, and lined up again, they're tuned differently, but they're in tune again, right? So it's the process in the middle in between the phases. Um, and if you want to think of it mathematically, I guess you could say there's, um, I don't know, like, uh, well, one, two, we got 12 of those. And let's say it takes us 10 times. It says, you know, between four to 16. Let's say it takes 10 repetitions of the top part in order for the bottom part to get over by one. So that would mean a top part plays uh, in the middle, in the 10 measures in between plays 120 attacks in the same time as the bottom piano plays 121 attacks. Now, if that were stably, that would be, if that were somehow stable, that would be like a, you know, 120 against 121, but it's not stable, it's constantly changing, right? It's not a grouping dissonance in that, in that same sense because um, the, it's not a, a straight palindrome, it just shifts ever so slightly as it gets as the bottom part gets faster and faster. Uh, it's almost a little bit like the idea of something getting out of tune. I think the analogy that holds with pitch is if you're on a single note, playing in unison on a single note, right? And somebody's changes their pitch ever so slightly 
until it gets out of tune, you hear those strange out of tune beats, and then you lock in again when you are uh, exactly a half step away. And if you're accustomed to 12 tone uh, tuning, and that is to say to do a chromatic scale with 12 notes, you're not really accustomed to quarter tone tuning or 16 note octaves or anything like that, you'll hear something along the lines of unison followed by out of tuneness, things that just don't feel in tune. In fact, something that sounds unpleasant, at least the first few times you hear it, until things lock in again at another place. And so if you think about it, the analogy holds pretty well because you have two notes that are relatively close in frequency. Um, you have uh, in between, you have two notes, two singers that are lined up on the same note, same frequency. One of them changes the frequency ever so slightly, increases it little by little until it achieves a frequency that combined with the original one makes the sense of an actual interval. We'll call it, say, a semitone, right? Um, and this is kind of the same thing. The bottom piano increases its frequency ever so slightly until it achieves, um, uh, until it moves one thing ahead. The difference between the analogy with pitch is that it doesn't find a new frequency that's in tune. It locks back into the original frequency again once it gets one note ahead. So the process of getting out of tune is similar to the pitch analogy. The process of lining up again is different. But um, you can see there's a way in which the same analogy holds. Uh, so listen to this one more time. We're going to listen to the beginning, uh, you know, three minutes or so uh, to go through some of these phases and some of these transition sections um, and see what you hear if it corresponds to any of the things I've been saying. <laughs> 
So <clears throat> I promised you a few questions. Uh, actually, I think just one question is all you need to respond to in order to show that you have watched this all the way through, or at least artfully fast forwarded all the way to the end. Um, uh, the question is, Uh, the question is, what color is my hat? 